please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Welcome to the CNBC TV 18 special. I'm Shireen Bhan and we're in conversation with the global managing partner of McKinsey and the India managing partner of McKinsey, Gotham and Kevin. Appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. And Kevin, congratulations. Four days uh, uh, into the job. Uh, uh, you know, you're here in India in your capacity as global managing partner. You've met the who's who uh, of corporate India, all of your clients. What's the mood like? What's the sense that you get about the India story today? The mood is positive. Uh, I came expecting it to be positive because when you're outside India, you look in on a country that's got growth ahead of anywhere else in the world and you feel that there's so much potential. What I was looking to hear was how are people feeling both in the short term and the long term. And mm. I would say there was a general sense of confidence around the long term and a feeling that there is good momentum at the moment. So in general, the mood was positive. Okay, but about the short term? Well, I think in the short term, people recognize that there's been a lot of change happening in the economy with the GST the cash situation. So there's been quite a bit of change. I think there's a feeling, you know what, it's a bit more settled now. Um, I think there are inevitably some questions around political uncertainty coming up. But in general, the mood was positive for the short term as well. Mm -hmm. Gautam, uh, you know, you have your pulse on on corporate India much more perhaps than Kevin does because you spend more time here. Uh, what, what do you believe uh, are people excited about today and what are they nervous about? I think uh, if I had to, if one way to frame it is I think the micro story I think has gotten much better, but the macro story has gotten a bit muted mm -hmm. if I had to look at over the last year or so. I think as you well know, I think there's a little bit of concern on some of the macros around the rupee has never been weaker. I think the oil, the, the non-performing asset as a resolution I think is still taking its painful time. I think the corporate debt issue is still with us. But uh, if you look at micro, I mm. think what I'm excited about is I think for the first time we're seeing some positive recovery on the capital expenditure cycle and I think the earnings results actually have been quite strong and uh, I think uh, my instinct overall I think is that people are obviously a little bit uh, anticipating what will happen with the elections next year but mm. by and large I think the Indian business at least uh, many of the entrepreneurs that I talk to remain very optimistic and bullish uh, about the big opportunity in India I think they recognize that this is one of the few countries that will I think still add many more trillion dollars to its economy, mm. and more than uh, almost any other market with the exception of perhaps US and China can do. Mm. Speaking of uh, India and the long term story uh, and China, in that context you've, you've China for the first time a standalone region for McKinsey. Uh, where are we likely to see that for India? I'd love to make India a standalone region of the firm. I think the only thing that holds me back is just the question of when India gets to the size of the economy where we can do that. But I, like Gautam, believe that we're not that far away. If you think about the prospects of adding and making this a $5 trillion economy, I think at that point one would have to say it would more than earn its right to be at the table in that capacity. Mm -hmm. So this could happen yet. What excites you about China today? Look, I've lived in China on and off since 1995. Um, the Chinese economy is going to be the largest economy in the world. It's just a matter of time. Is it, are we five years or ten years away from that in absolute terms? That has to excite one. But the biggest thing that I think we need to keep an eye on in China is the amount of innovation that's happening there mm. now, particularly in the digital space. I think it's fair to say that China lost out in the original industrial revolution and ever since has been looking for an opportunity to correct that. And I think now as we look at the fourth industrial re revolution, sensor technology, telecommunications, 5G, China's determined to be in the lead there. There's a lot to learn from what's happening in the digital economy in China. You know, just linking the digital economy and the possibility of, uh, uh, of the threat that uh, President Trump has held out impacting uh, investments into tech companies specifically when it comes to China. How real is that, even though there's been a little bit of a pullback? And what impact is that likely to have? Well, it's a bit confusing to try and understand whether there's a threat or actual issues. ZTE, as you saw, got approved. So I think at this point it's hard to make any definite conclusions. My own sense is, look, we're in a tech situation now where global data flows are going to trump any, and I don't use that word deliberately, but are going to get over any obstacles that people put in the way in the short term. And I think that's true in China. I think it's true in the United States as well. Mm. Uh, what's the mood like as far as global growth is concerned? Because it's never been stronger, at least in the recent past. But with this business of tariff wars escalating, not just between US and China, but now the EU and just about every ally that the US has, uh, including even uh, uh, you know possibility of uh, escalation here with India. Uh, how do you see that impacting global growth going well, forward? It's real concern. Um, if you actually look at where we are today, 
the up rates on the growth rate from 3.5 to 3.7. Things are feeling good. We've got growth everywhere. However, the cloud on the horizon is the trade situation. And it could have a very material impact. I think at this point in time, we're not in a trade war, but we are on the brink of one. And you list a couple of the examples. You know, on Friday, we'll find out whether the $50 billion of tariffs that America says it will put in Chinese imports happens. Uh, we will find out where NAFTA heads in the future. We will find out what happens with the auto industry. If you added all those up, we will certainly be in the middle of a trade war. And if that happens, then mm. definitely that will dampen global growth very materially. I am optimistic, however, that the benefits of trade will outweigh the concerns we see right see happening today and hopefully we will find a th way through this uh, very tense situation that we have at mm. the moment. Since you understand China, uh, uh, Kevin, let me ask you, what do you believe could be the points of leverage from the Chinese perspective as we get through these negotiations? The largest economy in the world, that's a pretty powerful point of leverage. I think the reality is business wants to be in China and China has an export capacity that means that the rest of the world wants Chinese exports. And so I think the biggest point of leverage is that. It's the sheer size of the economy. And let's remind ourselves that for many companies, whether they're American or European, they've got operations in China. They've established manufacturing facilities. They have supply chain that's dependent on China. That's the point of leverage. It's in everybody's interest to find a way through this. Mm. Let's see if that can happen. Well, uh, Gotham, what could the impact be, not just of the tariff escalation, uh, even though we've threatened to retaliate and we've notified the WTO uh, with respect to the steel and aluminum duties that the U.S. has imposed, but outside of that, how do you see all of this impacting FDI flows? India has seen record FDI flows, but the pace of growth has slowed down. Uh, you know, do you believe that that is going to be something that we are now going to have to live with? I think, firstly, I'm delighted with the trend in FDI. As you know, I think in the first half of this year, I think if my memory serves me right, we've had about $30 billion of FDI flow into the country. I think it's, it's, it's probably the peak. It's the highest mm -hmm. ever it's been. I think my instinct is that uh, despite you know, some of the trade issues that might uh, have some short-term sentimental issues, I think the biggest leverage, as Kevin said, is I think is the fact that we are, in fact, one of the largest and the fastest-growing economies in the world. Mm -hmm. That cannot be ignored. So I think, to me, I think where I am focused more from the FDI standpoint is I think if we can create the right uh, environment, mm. the transparent environment, the right regulatory framework, and the right level of transparency and dispute resolution around some of the big infrastructure and investment opportunities for India. So I think we have to remain focused on creating that environment to mm. make India a preferred destination for some of the FDI money that should come here. And I hope, by the way, that as a China, if this thing does escalate, I hope that India preferentially <laughs> stands out and benefits from, uh, from some of that. I hope so. Uh, but just speaking of the regulatory framework that's been created, uh, especially to be able to unlock some of the stressed assets, uh, we've now got this AMC and the AIF route that has been proposed by the Sunil Mehta Committee, uh, which would have obviously require capital institutional funding. Do you see that being an area of opportunity, especially from a global perspective? I definitely think so. I think I definitely think so. I think we've been all, all along the waiting, I think, some more positive movement on the resolution. I'm personally quite uh, positive about, I think, what we've seen happen over the last three days with the finance minister and the committee report, and I think the framework sounds very compelling. And I do think that I think the time is to act on it. And I think we do know that uh, there are there's no lack for funding for uh, investable properties in India. I think mm -hmm. we just, I have no doubt that I think as we talk to some of the large uh, private and institutional investors around the world. India needs five trillion dollars of money mm. over the next 15 years. We will not be able to meet our infrastructure demands without attracting that capital. So I think the resolution of this, uh, if done right, I think can open, I believe can open. Any the sectors in specific that where you see the capital uh, moving towards? I mean, steel, for instance, when you look at the stressed portfolio, has been a sector where we've actually seen a dogfight in the market, quite literally. Uh, cement, another area uh, where we've seen that play out. But, you know, in, in this basket, what do you believe is likely to attract attention? Well, if you look and at the stress, well, firstly, if you look at the portfolio, we all know it is largely steel power is, I think, almost, uh, if again my analysis, uh, memory serves me right, is almost two thirds of the assets are in those two verticals. So I think that will be natural. I think that will be natural and that will that'll definitely happen. But then beyond that, when I talk about the five trillion, I think we need about a trillion and a half in, uh, in power. I think we need about a trillion in airports. I think we need a heck of a lot more in roads, in rails. Mm. So I think from a, 
future investment opportunity, I think uh, we need it in many, many of those slivers beyond just power and steel. Mm. Uh, Kevin, let me talk to you about the road ahead as far as McKinsey is concerned. I remember reading an interview where you said that you see yourself as an innovator and a consolidator. What does that mean exactly in the consulting innovator, business? Not a consolidator. Look, I am blessed by coming into my role when our firm has great momentum. Uh, we've been innovating at a pace that has exceeded anything we've done before. Uh, but what I mean by that is I think there are some spaces where we should be continuing to really make sure we're building additional capability to help our clients. Technology. Technology being the prime example. I'm pleased with the base we've got. I think there's so much more we can do. And I feel that the opportunity we have to really take the skills that we've applied and bring them to the world of technology at a scale we've not done before is one that I think all our clients want to see. Mm. So that's an example of a place where I think we'll innovate both in terms of what we do, but also the partnerships that we do with others who are also in this space. And I think that will be a change in what we do. It will be a change in who we have in terms of the people that we've got. But importantly, I hope we will still, and this is the point I actually was making, was I'm an innovator, but also I believe in our values. I'm a traditionalist in that sense. Mm. I hope we will do it at a standard that we have set. Um, and we will maintain that standard in any area that we go into, even as we expand what we how do. How much of this capability is going to be driven organically and how much of it is going to be driven inorganically? Because under Dominic Barton, you did about a dozen odd acquisitions. Are we right. going to see that continue to, to happen? Yes. Yes? Yes. I fully expect that there will be opportunities where we have the chance to bring others into the firm uh, who have the skills and the capabilities we think meet the standard that we want to deliver to our clients. And that is, I think, a, a natural progression of the reality that we're not the, we don't have a monopoly on talent. We need to find new ways to bring people into McKinsey, and that part of that will be through acquisitions. I also think some of those acquisitions, though, will be in the area of data mm. and really making sure we have analytical techniques and proprietary data that we can use to help our clients. Mm. Would India be some uh, a sort of market that you would scout around for potential acquisitions? India is a very important market when it comes to talent and capabilities. And I think we've found that over the years, and I fully expect that to continue. So, of course, we will definitely be looking hard in India. So, outside of beefing up tech capabilities, the other area of interest and focus for you, I understand, is your geographic diversity as well as your gender diversity. Yeah. And that's a point that I want to talk to you about, Gotham, because you have, what, about 60 partners? That's How correct. many women? Well, Five. At, at this point, not yes, enough. Enough, not enough, not, not enough. enough. I have to admit that. But I'll be honest with you, I think that's a big challenge, firstly, for the country. I think, we, as you know, we've done quite a bit of work on gender parity yeah. recently, and I think I am embarrassed to admit that uh, women in our workforce, uh, I think we have, they contribute collectively less than 20% of our GDP mm. and less than one-fourth of our workforce. So, so you do a report on parity, and you have five women yeah. out of 60 partners in India. How do you explain that? So I, I don't think I, I can I really have a good answer to you question other than to let you know that we are absolutely taking this head on. Mm. We are taking this head on. I think we aspire. You should know that one third of all recruits that come into McKinsey now are women and we are taking that target up to 50 percent. So we expect that half of the people coming into McKinsey in about two years time will be all women. Uh, you should uh, be aware that uh, I think if you think about our partners, I think you're right. It's only about uh, about uh, five or 60 and I think we're committed to have at least 25 percent of our partners by 2020, 21 mm -hmm. to be women partners. So we've taken this on as a big priority. And I think part of the reason is simply because I think we believe that we cannot remain preeminent unless we tap into that talent pool. Mm. And I think we historically haven't done uh, done lived up to our own expectations and we are committed to changing that. Mm -hmm. So what's the plan? How do you get more women into McKinsey and how do you ensure that they stay on and how do you then ensure that they, they actually make senior partner and partners? Well the problem isn't getting women into McKinsey. As a firm we're getting up to 50 percent. We're about 42 percent today. This year will be 45 percent women at the entry level. So that's not the issue. The issue is retention. Mm. And I think there are many things we need to do. First of all we should learn from the offices that are doing very well. China is roughly 45% heading to 50% female. The partnership in China is 40% female. And I think one of the things we really need to get much better at doing is recognizing that our women colleagues do have different career paths to our male colleagues. And we need to stop measuring things by time and start measuring things even more by the quality of what people do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things we're going to be looking very hard at is how we evaluate our people and importantly, how we provide opportunities for people to leave for a while, come back, and be so successful. I'm actually very confident that the type of work we do should lend itself to women and others who take career breaks to have kids or do something else, because we're essentially working on engagements, projects. Mm. And there are therefore natural breaks in those. 
But we have to find a way to square that circle, and we are very determined to do it. And there are parts of the world where we are. So I don't believe this is a lost cause. Mm. I believe, though, we have to redouble our efforts. But is this going to be women-centric policies, or is this going to be for m women and men? Because a lot of people are now realizing that if you make this about women, then it actually acts as a deterrent uh, from people wanting to hire more women. At least that's yeah. the downside of, of the maternity bill that, uh, that's just been enacted here in India. Uh, it's just been a year, sure. but that's one of the downsides that's already being seen. I have a different view on that. I believe mm. very firmly we need to get to a place where we have 51% of our firm is female because that's where the world is and we should deliberately work towards that task in doing so I believe we will actually benefit women and men because some of it will get to the way we work the work-life balance issue which is a real one in consulting I believe will be improved because we're thinking about what we do for our women but I want to be very clear the targets the aspirations I'm talking about are against women and therefore we have to find a way to improve what we're doing and we have to just as we're writing about it mm. we have to do everything that we write about mm. you know since you're talking about writing about things the criticism often uh, for the consulting business in general is that there's a lot of stuff that's written up there's yes. reams of paper lots of reports but how much of that is actually executed on the ground? How much of that is followed through? Since we're talking about innovations within the consulting business, let me ask you that question, Gotham, and I'll put that to you, sure. Kevin. Uh, you know, uh, report after report, but actual execution, is that now proving to be a little bit of a challenge for the consulting business? Well, I, I think actually the profession has changed quite radically, by the way. While we do write a lot, I think in reality a lot of our clients, if not most of our clients, actually hire us, at least in India for sure, for outcomes. Hmm. I think increasingly, I think is it the outcome that they want? I think is it a preordained outcome? Not really. And I think what I mean is, you know, you, you look, you and I both live in India. I think yeah. we are. This is a market where people are actually quite performance oriented. And I think if you look at, I'm actually very excited by the level of performance focus that most of our Indian clients have. And I think they don't have lazy capital mm. to spend on mm. any partners, including on consulting partners. So I think when we get engaged, I think typically it has to be one of the top most priorities for those companies. And I think they want to see results. And they want just not only one-time results, mm. I think they want to build capability in their organization so that the results can be sustained. And that's what we're all about. So I think we take a lot of pride in talking about impact mm. and delivering impact. Mm. And I'm proud that uh, you know, we had the opportunity to serve now about 50 companies in India for more than 20 years. Yeah. And I think the only reason we've had those long-standing relationships is because it's not about writing reports. Mm, mm. Uh, we do a lot of that in the spirit of helping countries shape policy, influence management thinking in India, but what we do day to day is really about impact. Mm. And that's the only way you know, we, 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 we will survive and uh, we, we continue to survive and thrive. You know, speaking of reports and speaking about uh, uh, impact, I know that you've been working with the Indian government on Digital India, yes. and that report is expected uh, shortly. Yes. Uh, so, give me a sense of of uh, what are going to be the key drivers. I mean, you know, the Digital India has nine pillars and so yes. on and so forth. But specifically, what do you really see as the road ahead? You see, we are very excited, as you would expect. I think India is now the second largest internet uh, user market in the world and probably the fastest growing in terms of digital adoption. I think some of the work that the government has helped facilitate through whether it's the um, Aadhaar thing or UPI and so forth, I think has created, uh, unleashed what I would call some fundamental digital platforms that I think are encouraging digital adoption to pick up dramatically. Mm. Our estimate is that by 2025, I think the digital economy could be about a trillion dollars, could add a trillion dollars to India's economy. Digital economy could have the same share of GDP as manufacturing sector has today. Mm -hmm. It will be probably five times the size of the Indian IT and BPO industry in terms of its impact. Mm. And we've identified about nine or ten what I would call lighthouse projects or areas where I think the, there is real potential to reshape how business gets done. As an example, I think lending to small and medium enterprises is an right. example of something that can get completely disrupted as it is being done today on yeah. the back of digital. So yeah. we are very, very optimistic about uh, what this will do for this country. Mm -hmm.